um, okay, so natural menopause, I mean, as um, Lindsay also said, is defined as the permanent cessation of menstruation resulting from the loss of follicular activity, and this has been defined by the WHO. Now, whenever we speak about menopause, we speak about either there can be natural, where it occurs naturally in the body, at, uh, or you can have either surgical or medical procedures as such as like hormonal replacement therapy if a person underwent hysterectomy or if it is you're taking things like chemotherapy or something like that right now the average age occurrence for menopause is between 45 and 55 years however it tends to vary across race slash ethnicity so in caucasian slash western persons you're going to find it around 51 years while in eastern or asian you're going to find it around 49 years. Now, menopause brings uh, an array of symptoms uh, such as mood swings, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, uh, um, depression, and overall it affects a woman's mental health. It is estimated by the year 2030 that 1.2 billion women will be menopausal. Okay. Now, there are several factors that contribute to the age at which menopause occur, right? And these factors are things such as your reproductive history, lifestyle factors, socioeconomic factors, medical treatments, environmental exposures, health conditions, and also genetics, ethnicity, and race, which is what it is. I will be focusing on my research. Now, why exactly do we want to be able to like predict the age of menopause? Because risk prediction is important for early menopause and when i refer to early menopause i'm referring to persons like 45 years and younger and early menopause is associated with lower bone mass density osteoporosis depression the risk of getting type 2 diabetes or even cardiovascular disease however late menopause which is menopause from 55 years and over like a person getting menopause 55 years and over they are at increased risk for certain cancers such as breast, endometrial, and ovarian. Um, in order to be able to understand menopause and the factors that affect it, there have been many research conducted to identify these factors. Uh, recently, well, in 2022, a systematic research was conducted in which it is they used um, univariate and multivariate analyses to be able to identify some of the factors. And this is excluding genetics, so just in terms of like biochemistry and environmental factors. And unfortunately, you're unable to see, but what happened is that they identified 4,415 scientific publications on this particular topic. But after um, they're like using this prisma, this prisma count like to, to be able to identify um, in certain inclusion criteria like this persons like at the age of menopause in terms of like the statistical methods that they use, sample size and everything like methodological design, they were able to extrapolate only 14 publications. From those 14 <coughs> publications, and this is what you're not able to see properly, is that they identify age, AMH, which is like anti-malaria hormone, um, FSH, follicular stimulating hormone, they looked at BMI, they looked at smoking, estradiol, val estradiol, and these are just some, like the major parameters that was identified in terms of the association with age of menopause. However, when it is they looked at this, they were only able to identify age and AMH. Now, AMH in general is is a biological test that we use to be able to, to determine um, ovarian uh, follicular activity. So women that are trying to conceive, they will normally have like an AMH test um, performed. Now from these studies, there was a lot of limitations in terms of the methodological deficiencies. So if you look at this here, like a risk of bias assessment, so all these 14 studies, they had like the appropriate sample size. However, when it came to like predictors, um, it was not very well. Also, outcomes analysis and the overall, it wasn't good. So these 14 studies, they still like wasn't able to produce a conclusive result as to what exactly can we use as predictive parameters for the age of menopause. Following this now, I decided because our research is mainly focused on um, genetics. So we looked at uh, 
there was studies where this persons looked at Mendelian randomization in which it is it explored like whether modifiable exposure is causally linked to a particular outcome. So in this skull, in this case, like your modifiable exposure is like your genetic variance and your outcome is your age at which menopause is going to occur. And what they did is that they, in this particular study, they looked at women um, where they wanted to be able to identify like a woman who are likely to experience age of menopause, does it like have an association with monarchy or does it not have that association? Also, they want to be able to find, so there was some, before I say that, there were, there has been genome-wide association studies conducted to be able to identify significant associations with the age of menopause. And these significant associations are, are single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are SNPs. These SMPs, once you're able to identify these significant SNPs, which is at the threshold P multiplied by uh, five, sorry, multiplied by 10 to the P less than five by 10 to the minus eight, what happens is that then they be able, they want to be able to link that to these metabolites. So in this case, the biomarkers that they are identifying are metabolites. So they want to be able to identify, so the age of monarchy are these metabolites, uh, is there like a causal relationship and also for the age at which menopause occurs. So this was just like one, like another method. So we saw like univariate analysis, the multivariate analysis just using general biochemical parameters and environmental factors. Here they use Mendelian randomization to identify um, genetic effect on the age of menopause. There was also another study that uh, identified common, they use polygenic prediction. So when we speak about polygenic prediction, they use something called the Repogen. Now the Repogen is a database that has an analysis of, a meta-analysis of data across like in the UK Biobank, also um, Breast Cancer Association, and then several other smaller meta-analyses, which is like over 44 meta-analyses combined. And what they did is that they ran a GWAS on this and they found that there was 290 significant variants. From these 290 significant variants, they tried to replicate this as well to this method into other databases as well too, such as ENCODE. And then also what they did is that they decided to extrapolate just only UK Biobank patients and they generated PG scores, which is polygenic scores from that against like non-UK biobank participants as well too. When they generated that, they looked at persons between ages of 40 and 60, which is the persons of interest. And what happened is that if you look at this formula here, where they look at age and natural, so using a linear regression to be able to understand, age and natural menopause is equal to beta O, where beta O in this case is your intercept, meaning that so that, uh, that point, that age at which your polygenic score is going to be zero, right? Then after you would have plus beta one, where that is your linear coefficient by your PGS that will determine the age at which menopause occurs. And then you also include your error as well. Now what happened is that here, if you look at this panel, the first one here, which is part A, what they did was that they, they plotted the mean genetic score against the age at menopause and just by visually looking at this you can see that there's a positive correlation right because it goes positively and what they found is that higher scores were related with the onset of later menopause while lower scores were related with lower menopause age of menopause something else that they were also able to find is that they looked at the odds ratio for menopause age less than 45 but when they looked at it for less than 45, they looked at the genetic risk for those persons less than age 45. And then they also looked at the percentile range as well too. So they found that there was a significant association between that genetic risk in terms of the percentile um, increase for those persons that had um, the age of menopause at under 45. Also, they also just replicated it here for the finding the odds ratio for um, premature ovarian insufficiency as well too and found the same results. Now what they realized too from this first panel here 
um, part A is that this age of menopause, like if you just look at it here, you can see that there's a genetic influence, like a genetic influence on the age of menopause. So what they did was that they tried to identify genetic risk alone, but they realized that genetic risk alone, when you take it into consideration, I'm talking about this equation, it was weak. But if it is they incorporated PGs on the age of menopause, then they got like a value um, of 0 0.68. When they try to look at only smoking only, that parameter only, then it was not it was not very good. It was low, which was 0.58. But then when they included PGs and smoking, then they got a value of 0 0.66, which was not a, as not as bad as smoking alone. Okay. So, I mean, this here was just another way, like another method in which it is they use to be able to identify um, age of, but not identify, to predict the age of menopause. Now, another method again too that has been used is the Cox proportional method. Now in general, the Cox <coughs> proportional method estimates like whatever is your predictor variable in terms of that outcome over a standard time frame. However, this paper, which I actually found very interesting is that this here, so this first part of the graph here is where it is, it's non-linear, but the second one is where they actually, in this model, they incorporated a linear component to take into consideration, so they are not looking over just constant time, but over varying time, which was actually interesting. So in using this model, it was actually, they were able to identify 90 more new genetic variants as well too. And the model was flexible, accurate description of the SNPs. And what they were able to identify with this model was three major questions that they were able to identify. One, what is that significant interval? Meaning that that significant age range at which you're going to find more significant SNPs. Secondly, strongest evidence for effects. So at what age you are going to find like the most significant SNP at that particular age? And also, is the slope beta one significantly different from the slope beta one and the other one here, which is like expected as compared to true at zero? Now what I actually liked about this because I wasn't aware while reading was that SNPs apparently, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that they can, the significance can change over time. So in what this paper was saying is that at uh, like the steps that they might identify, let's like say for example, at age 35, it may be significant, but then at age 45, it may not be significant. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but that's just what I, that's what this paper was talking about, which is why they included that additional um, linear term. Right, so 